Awesome. So a little bit about me. There's, I guess, some similarities between Patrick and I. Um, I actually grew in a semi-rural area. Um, I think most of my childhood, I was, you know, playing with horses around my neighbor's horses and and goats and donkeys and stuff. Um, not as uh, farming as Patrick, but different than a lot of my friends who I went to school with, because I used to go to school um, many miles away from where I actually lived. But um, I had a very small family. So my family's from Brazil and a lot of my cousins, um, grandparents, aunts and uncle were all in Brazil. So for most of my childhood, I didn't really see many of them. Um, just an occasional trip where I would go back home. But these five people here were basically in my life every day. We all lived in the same home throughout my whole life, my grandparents and my parents. So it was really tight knit and I spent most of my time with them. Um, my sister has always been a, a model for me. She's always been a very intelligent role model. And I've always tried, competed and tried to like, you know, meet her standards, but she definitely pushed me to be a better person in many ways. And throughout most of my life, I, I want to be a soccer player. So some of you guys know me um, as, as a soccer player, but I think for until I got to college, I think that was what I wanted to do. And I didn't really focus too much on school. I mostly practiced every day, played games multiple times a week. And that was my dream and really my goal. And at a certain point, I think I realized that you know, it wasn't feasible and I had to figure out what I was going to do after that. And that was kind of difficult for me because um, not putting a lot of effort in school during those early days kind of made me feel like I was a little bit behind. So when I first um, went to college in Riverside, I kind of struggled a little bit um, for the first couple years. I didn't really know how to study because I didn't really study much at during high school. Um, just kind of did what I needed to do to pass. But um, I kind of developed an interest towards science when I got an internship at a company called ISCA, um, which is Portuguese for, word, for the word hook. So the company actually develops, um, I guess, non-pesticide traps for insects. And the first actual science experience I had was actually with these little, beautiful little creatures here called cockroaches. Um, I would actually create these natural concoctions of like peanut butter, banana, smashed bananas, and like different scents of, you know, flower oils and all this stuff and like make little dollops and then take out cockroaches from this, these huge tanks and then put them into a box and just like watch them and count how many times they would touch these little special recipes that I created in the hopes that we can like create something that they'll be attracted to and then actually be able to you know, control them a little bit better. And the goal was to actually use sticky like traps instead of using pesticides. So it'd be a little bit better for the environment and better for the creatures as well. Um, but yeah, this this really opened the door of like a possible career. Cause I, I, I think I, and, and maybe some of you never really felt like science or research was like a career choice that was possible. So um, this definitely opened the door to what science really was. And I had a great um, team that worked with me you know one of my best friends was my boss there and we still talk to this day and so it was a really good experience for me to kind of develop a new life goal and passion for what I wanted to do and I was really fortunate you know the next year to be able to um, be given the opportunity to work in a biomedical research lab so Mark U Star is it's a great program that helps people who are underprivileged to get a funded research experience and um, I was in an environment with a lot of peers that I could, I could relate to in, in many different ways. Um, this was my class and back then, and they're all very fun group of people who I'm still in contact to this day. And we're all across the world or the U.S. Um, in different PhD programs. And it was a great experience to kind of do that. And my mentor, Ernest Martinez, was, I don't know, he's, he was a great, a great guy. And we used to talk every day. He was very hands-on and I learned a lot about how, you know, to be a better person and also be a better scientist and learned a lot about different methods, which pushed me to be, to improve my science career. And I was able to publish a first author paper during that time with, with his guidance. And it was, it was a really fun time. And even through that program, I was able to go to Wild Cornell for a summer 
and participate in their Access Summer Research Program where I met a lot of people. I never really been out of California at that time, so other than Brazil, but it was really cool to kind of see, you know, a different side of the world that I wasn't um, really used to because, I don't know, growing up in California, you kind of think the whole United States is all like California and in reality, it's really not. So I think that kind of opened my eyes to a different perspective and, and to a lot of different cultures as well. And now I'm at, you know, UC San Diego. I'm in the Gukin lab here at UCSD. Silvio has been a great mentor and I'm surrounded by a great cast of people who have been very supportive um, with me and my research. And it's been a, it's been a great five years. Um, and hopefully, you know, I want to stay here forever, but I do want to graduate soon, but it's been a great time. And I've really enjoyed my time in San Diego so far. Um, so a little bit about my research. Um, my study, I, I focus mostly on targeting metabolic, metabolomic signaling networks to halt head and neck cancer progression and improve immune cell longevity. Um, I just want to plug Sally Trin. She's an undergraduate that I've been um, working with. She's amazing. She's definitely helped most of the stuff that I'm going to show today. Um, I cut out some parts of my talk um, just a few minutes ago, just to kind of, for the sake of time, but I just kind of want to give a little bit of background on what head and neck cancer is and a little snapshot of what I've been, what I've done so far. Um, so essentially head and neck cancer is a cancer that affects both males and females. It typically um, occurs in the oral cavity, nasal pharynx, pharynx, and larynx. And some of the risk factors include heavy abuse of smoking and alcohol. And more recently, there's been an increased incidence of HPV-associated cancers. And about every year, there's about 65,000 cases and about 15,000 deaths in just the US. And worldwide, there's around 500,000 cases. So it's definitely cancer that affects a big population um, in the US and worldwide. Um, typically, patients who have head and neck cancers uh, undergo a surgery. Um, relative to other cancers, it's pretty accessible since it's in the oral cavity. Um, so it's not the most complicated surgery, but after the surgery, they either undergo chemotherapy or radiotherapy or both. Um, but more recently, they've been, um, a lot of more patients are actually receiving immunotherapy, which has been pretty hot in the field. So one of those immunotherapies is, um, you know, checkpoint blockades. And the most common one is uh, targeting the anti-PD-1, which is a inhibitory receptor on T cells. And essentially what occurs is that tumor cells are, using our immune's regulatory system to kind of churn off the immune response. So by using antibodies that block that receptor on T cells, you can allow the T cells to still do its anti-tumor function. So in the clinical trial that was actually done here at UCSD by Ezra Cohen at the Morris Cancer Center, um, he showed that um, with anti-PD-1 therapy, volumab, we actually see a 20% increase in survival. And that's you know great for patients, and it's a really astounding result um, compared to conventional therapy, but still not where we want to be. So our lab and many other labs um, here at UCSD and across the nation are trying to figure out ways to improve this immunotherapy response. And the way that um, I kind of want to address this is basically the question that I want to ask or answer is. You know, can modulating the immune system and head and neck cancer with conventional therapies improve the outcome for patients? And my hypothesis is that by targeting the metabolic networks, I can, you know, promote that immune modulation and head and neck cancer by limiting the cancer progression, but also protecting the infiltrating immune cells from functional exhaustion. And I hope to do that with these two aims. Um, one aim was to actually create a mouse model. I'm not going to go into, into that just for the sake of time, but um, it's a paper that we published recently, but we've essentially created a new model that actually represented head and neck cancer um, better than the models that were present a couple years ago. And then using that model, I wanted to see um, whether the impact of targeting oxidative phosphorylation or glutamine metabolism could um, enhance the immune response and also hinder tumor growth. So really quick on the model, um, we used this uh, compound called foreign Kyo, which mimics uh, many different compounds found in tobacco. And if you give this compound to mice in their drinking water, they develop um, oral squamous cell carcinoma in their tongues and oral cavity. Um, the issue of this model is that it takes 16 to 22 weeks to develop lesions. And I wanted to graduate in five years, not 10 years. So um, we had the great idea to actually start collecting these lesions and creating these different cell lines that we can then inject 
into mice, into their tongue, and then treat them with different drugs, analyze their growth, um, do a bunch of different studies, and um, have a great model to, to test that. And um, basically, for the first couple of years of my PhD, I characterized this model with many members in this lab, and we saw different conditions and different therapies that worked and didn't work. And um, it was a great model to use. And what I'm currently using to study um, metabolism in head and neck. So something that I'm really excited and always been um, interested in is metabolism. And, you know, tumor microenvironment is a very toxic environment. You have cancer cells, you have immune cells, they're fighting each other. They're releasing cytotoxic chemicals, um, but they're also fighting for nutrients. So if you imagine the nutrients in the tumor microenvironment as a Krabby Patty from Sponge and Bob and each part of the burger being a different essential nutrient for um, these cells. Um, typically in a tumor microenvironment, tumor cells are consuming all the Krabby Patties, all the nutrients and the immune cells are left with hardly anything. And this is another way that immune cells are actually exhausted in the immune microenvironment. So I always, I always thought it would be a great idea if we can switch the script and essentially allow the immune cells to consume everything and prevent the cancer cells from consuming um, those, those, those nutrients so that not only would you hinder the, the cancer cells from growing because they don't have the nutrients to grow, but also enhance the immune cells um, response by giving them more nutrients to do their thing. So the two ways I wanted to do that was by targeting glutamine, which is an essential amino acid um, that most abundant, uh, abundant amino acid in our body, and also by using uh, metformin to tar target oxidophosphorylation. So unfortunately, I won't be able to talk about glutamine today. I just want to focus on metformin. Um, but these are the two projects that I, I'm working on right now. So metformin um, is a drug that um, my PI loves, um, and I love it as well, because it's, it's a very cheap and non-toxic drug that has been shown to um, actually hinder tumor growth. Metformin is typically used for diabetic patients, and essentially pushes your cells into a more glycolytic state, which re reduces your blood glucose levels um, throughout your body. And it does this by inhibiting the oxidative phosphorylation pathway, which results in less ATP production by um, the, the electron transport chain, which pushes you to be in a more glycolytic state, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but it also kind of hinders a lot of other pathways that are important for protein synthesis and proliferation. So um, there's been many studies that have shown that patients who do take metformin for diabetes actually have lower risks of certain types of cancer, including head and neck cancer. So, um, looking in those syngenic models that I mentioned earlier, I wanted to see how metformin um, would affect their growth. So uh, skip that slide. Um, in these two models, FORMOSC1 and MOC1, which are syngenic, they're in mice that have immune systems. I found that when you treat the mice with metformin, you actually see a reduction in their tumor growth, as shown in the growth curves and in the um, tissues uh, sections shown below. Um, we used the dose of metformin that was equivalent to um, patients who actually take uh, metformin for their diabetes. So we measured the plasma levels in the mice. So we, we wanted to mimic what was um, seen in the clinic. Um, with this reduction in tumor growth, I, actually, I also wanted to see how it affected the tumor immune microenvironment. So I did um, a really cool experiment using Cytof, which is a way that you can look at many different immune cells by um, using a bunch of different antibodies that, you know, will bind to specific targets that can uh, help you identify different immune cell populations. And each of these antibodies are tagged with a metal probe that when you put through a mass cytometer, you can then identify um, which cells express those um, targets that you're interested in. So I did it in, I did Cytoff for both 4MOSC1 and MOC1. I let them grow for about a couple of days, seven days, and then I treated them with metformin for five days, pulled out the tumors, and then looked at how the immune microenvironment changed. And sorry if it's a little bit small, but if you would focus on the light blue and red for both the Mach 1 and, and 4 Mach 1, um, you can kind of see in this overlap with metformin in blue and, and the vehicle in, in orange is that you see a bigger presence of this blue cell population in these um, same areas. Um, and I quantified here on the right, but essentially I see in when you treat mice of metformin who have tumors, you actually see increased antigen presenting cells, such as dendritic cells and M1 macrophages. And these cells are important because they pr provide the antigen for CD8s and CD4s to um, recognize, to actually promote the adaptive immune response to um, hopefully um, hinder the tumor growth and kill the tumor cells um, within the mice and, and patients as well. So 
with this result and this increase of antigen presenting cells, I wanted to see you know, what would happen if I started removing certain populations such as CD8 T cells, which are important for the adaptive immune response. So I did a CD8 depletion experiment in which I removed CD8s using an antibody um, a couple days before I actually injected the tumor cells. And then I later treated the mice metformin to see how, if I would still see an anti-tumor response. So in both the 4MOS1 and the Mach one when I removed the CD8s, um, you lose this anti-tumor response here um, in, in the blue. And you can also see in these images below that, you know, with metformin, you have barely any tumor left, but when you remove the CD8s, you have these large lesions in both the tongue model and in the flank model. Um, since I also saw that dendritic cells were, were important in the previous slide, I also wanted to see what would happen if I removed the dendritic cells. So I used this uh, very cool mouse model called the BAF3 knockout. Um, these mice actually lack conventional dendritic cells, which are very important for antigen presenting um, to uh, different adaptive immune cells. And in both cases, when I have a mouse that does not have those CDCs, I see um, no effect with the metformin drug, um, indicating that both CD8 T cells and conventional dendritic cells are important for or contribute to the metformin anti-tumor response. So I'm still trying to elucidate what's actually going on. You know, I'm giving metformin to a mouse that has tumor cells and, you know, all these cells have the transporters for metformin. So I don't know if metformin is acting through the tumor cell and then, you know, indirectly, you know, through the tumor cell and then affecting the immune cell or if it's acting direct to the immune cell and um, also directly through the tumor cells. So I'm, I'm hoping to use a lot of cool models that I'm developing right now to kind of tease this out to see what the actual function will be and also combine it with a lot of um, other immunotherapies to maybe enhance their um, immune response. Um, sorry if that was quick, but I'm, I'm totally open to answer some questions, but I wanna thank you guys all for your uh, attention. Um, everyone here highlighted in or bolded um, contributed to um, much of what I showed today. Um, I want to thank, you know, thank everyone that funded me. Um, I recently was uh, awarded the Gilliam Fellowship, which was um, very exciting and also opened a lot of new doors and um, connected with me with a lot of amazing people. Um, and I also wanted to end on this slide. Um, I know PhD life is quite hard at times and, you know, definitely has its low moments, but, you know, over the years, I've met a lot of people who are amazing, who've made this journey um, a lot easier. <laughs> um, but I just want to thank all of them as well. And just wanted to show, you know, that life is definitely still good. And yeah, that's all I got. Happy to answer any questions.